Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. My weekly exercise. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the passage we're looking at tonight, Acts chapter 27. The Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 14. There are some very interesting things in this passage, and uh, I trust that tonight we'll at least be able to touch briefly on a few of them. Acts chapter 21, verses 7 through 14. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Tolmice and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they that were of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will teach us to learn that the very best place to be in all of the world is the center of the will of the Lord. It's not something to fear. It's not something to run away from is not merely something to resign ourselves to, as the believers here in this passage apparently were doing. It is something to be sought, to pursue, to follow after hard, to earnestly desire, regardless of the temporal circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing on the going forth of your word tonight, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing on this time together tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. That's where they ended. That's where they should have started. Most of us end there after we've tried everything else. Well, I guess, I guess we're not going to get our own way, so I guess we just got to resign ourselves to whatever is the will of God. And we sort of sigh and moan and, but people, the will of God is the very best thing in all of the world for your life being squarely in the center of what God wants you to do, where God wants you to be, how God wants you to live, the testimony that you are to have in a very dark and very bleak godless world, the will of the Lord indeed will be done because God is sovereign and God controls all things, but sometimes our hearts and our minds don't want to be there. But the Apostle Paul had learned to view things from the eternal perspective, the divine perspective. He'd learned to look through the lens of Scripture. He'd learned to look into the face of a God who loved him and cared for him. And he understood that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And that even the bad temporal circumstances of life are not to be feared. Most of us function on the basis of how is it going to affect me? What is it going to cost me? What, if anything, will happen that I don't think is good? 
and we walk through life trembling and looking around corners and peeking under the covers and under the bed at night when things are dark and wondering about those noises that we think are coming out of the closet, which are probably merely cockroaches. And we spend our lives in fear. The book of Hebrews tells us that one of the things that Jesus did by his death on the cross is he destroyed the power of him who through fear of death all their lives held people in bondage, the devil. Jesus Christ casts out fear by love because perfect love casts out fear. The Apostle Paul was not a man filled with fear. He was a man filled with faith. And the more that you and I learn to walk by faith, the less we will walk by fear. And as we walk by faith, we will know that we are in the center of God's will. It's a fascinating passage here, the message entitled Prophets and Predestination. As we look at this passage, we are reminded of what immediately preceded it in verses 1 through 6. We find the disciples on their, or the Apostle Paul and those traveling with him on their journey <clears throat> had landed at Tyre in verse 3. We talked about Tyre. They spent a whole week there at Tyre. We saw that Tyre was a place where Satan had at one point set up his throne, and we looked at the different places in the New Testament where it tells us that Satan had had a presence, particularly in the book of Revelation, places where there were churches that had mostly crashed and burned, places where the churches had failed in their requirements for biblical church leadership and had allowed specific sins from Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 10 to go undisciplined in those churches, and we did quite a study on that. When Paul arrived at Tyre, he found disciples who were already there. They were not from his missionary journeys. They were perhaps from Barnabas and Mark, or others were not told, but there were others besides Paul who were spreading the word, because after the dispersion of the church from Jerusalem, after the death of Stephen, it says they went everywhere preaching the word. But we looked at Tyre for a few weeks and saw that there are three whole chapters in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 26, 27, and 28, that are given to curses against Tyre. It had historically been a seat of Satan. The two persons that are mentioned there, the Prince of Tyre and the King of Tyre, relate to the human king and then Satan, the one who is the real king, behind the throne of Tyre. And it describes him in quite a bit of detail there in Ezekiel chapter 28. But we pointed out that God loves to invade Satan's territory. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Gates don't move. Armies move. The gates of hell will not withstand the attack of God's people. And so there was a point at which God made a beachhead into the city of Tyre. Believers are there when Paul arrives. He spends a week with them. And we talked about the history of Tyre. We talked about 332, Alexander the Great besieging the city of Tyre after he'd conquered the mainland. Nebuchadnezzar had conquered the main city, but the people had fled to an island off the shore. But in 332, Alexander the Great and his soldiers took all the dirt and all the timbers and all the stones and scraped Tyre bare like the top of a rock in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And they dumped it into the ocean, made a causeway, and marched out to the island and conquered it. We saw that the Bible makes it clear that Satan rotates his seat between different cities around the world. And we looked at a number of places where that is mentioned. We looked in particular at the seven churches of Revelation, where we saw the key sins listed at all the locations where Satan had set up his headquarters, and then the key characteristics of the faithful believers who were in those locations. We looked at Ephesus. That was the fundamentalist church that became rigid and doctrinally correct, but mechanical in its ministry and lost its love for Christ. We saw that they recognized the specific attack of Satan with the Nicolaitans, and they avoided it, but that was not enough to overcome their lackluster mechanical service for Christ as a well-oiled machine. We talked about the six things that were related to the Nicolaitans. They also were found at the church at Pergamos. It was a major problem in first century Christian church, and it continues today. We saw that the six things that are mentioned, number one, the doctrine of Balaam, that's covetousness. 
Material wealth is worth compromising, spiritual truth of people who are into that. You can always find a way to get greedy money if you can find a way around God's commands. That's the first thing that's mentioned in relation to the Nicolaitans. They have the doctrine of Balaam. Second thing that we learn from church history is that immoral sex is okay. They had what they called the community of women, the Nicolaitans. Third, they were into eating things offered to idols no matter how it affected weaker believers, which was a misinterpretation of Paul's teaching over in 1 Corinthians, and we studied that. The weaker brother is not merely the one who opposes what you're doing. The weaker brother is the one who is tempted to do the same thing that really might be okay, but because they have a weak conscience and they go against their conscience, for them it is sin. We saw that the Nicolaitans also mixed pagan worship with Christian worship to appeal to be a seeker-friendly kind of a church, like the rock music and charismatic churches of today. Number five, we saw that the Nicolaitans denied God to be the creator of the world and attributed the world's existence to other powers like the theistic evolutionists do today. We've still got Nicolaitans in the church today. We talked about the possibility that that sect was found by Nicholas, one of the first deacons at Acts 6-5, a proselyte of Antioch, which is rather interesting because Nicholas and Philip were both deacons at the church at Jerusalem, Acts chapter 6, where they appointed these men to take care of the widows because the apostles were spending so much time taking care of the widows, they said, we've got to find some men who are qualified to do this. And we have Philip here tonight in our text. <laughs> and last week, we talked about the seats of Satan and how the Nicolaitans were there, and perhaps Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, was one of theirs also. He was a Gentile, converted to Judaism first, then converted to Christianity, but he had a background in pagan worship and practices, which then apparently filtered into the church. We looked at the church at Smyrna, the synagogue of Satan, it's called. It was doctrinally sound, living for Christ. It refused to compromise, and it suffered as a result. Then we looked at the church at Pergamos. It says where Satan's seat is, where Satan dwelleth. They were doctrinally sound. They were willing to suffer for Christ, but in practice, they had compromised with idolatry, fornication, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Number four, we looked at the church at Thyatira, the depths of Satan. They were good at practical Christianity. They really lived practical Christianity. But doctrinally, they were defective. They had female leadership. Moral rot had permeated that church. They taught and encouraged fornication and idolatry at a church. Their church is like that today. Then we looked at the church of Sardis. They had what we would call token Christianity based on their external works, but they had no heart commitment. You know, there are a lot of people in the church like that today. And good Bible preaching churches. They have a token Christianity based on what they've got for a veneer, what they look like, but they have no heart commitment. They may show up on Sunday morning when it's convenient or when there may be a good business contact that's going to be showing up on that same date or where there's somebody that they want to impress and when they don't have something else to do. But it's token Christianity. They have no heart commitment. And Jesus says in this fifth letter to the churches, he considered them defiled because of their lack of heart commitment. And he said, you know, the rest of you there at Sardis, you stand to have your names blotted out of the book of life. It was a church where there was a lot of phony Christianity. Then we looked at the church in Philadelphia, not the one right across the river from us, but in Asia Minor. Jesus says about that church that there was the synagogue of Satan. They were small, they were weak, but they were faithful. That was a church that was obedient to the word. That was a church that refused to deny Christ. They were patiently obedient, it says, and they were busy earning heavenly rewards. You know what? You can be successful in God's eyes, even if you're small. We're small. You can be successful in God's eyes if you are patiently obedient. If you're not busy making excuses as to why you can't do what God called you to do. You can be weak, but you can still earn heavenly rewards. 
if you're faithful. That's the church at Philadelphia, where the synagogue of Satan was located. Satan has set up his headquarters in various different places around the world. And then the last church we looked at was Laodicea, the rich, lukewarm, slothful church that just didn't care. A church that was proud of their material possessions, proud of their status, proud of their luxury and comforts, but they were out of fellowship with Christ. Here we are so concerned with our comfort. How have the mighty fallen? Comfort first. Pleasure first. Convenience first. Jesus, somewhere down the list. Maybe not last, but somewhere down the list. Fellowship with other believers, only if it's comfortable. Attendance at services and special events, only if it's convenient. That's Laodicea. Many times I'm troubled that perhaps we are like the church at Laodicea. And then we close the message last week with where is Satan's seat today? Perhaps it's Washington, perhaps Beijing, perhaps somewhere in the Middle East where ISIS is beheading Christians. Perhaps it's at Jerusalem. We know it will be at Jerusalem during the reign of the Antichrist. I suspect that today it's either Washington or Jerusalem. And that's what brings us to our text tonight, verses 7 through 14. Now, as we look at that, we learn several important things about prophecy and predestination from this passage. Number one, first, very clear, we find Agabus is a prophet and he is speaking through the Holy Ghost, verse 11. And we've discovered earlier as we've gone through the book of Acts that every place that Paul went on this trip as he's heading back to Jerusalem, every place the Spirit of God tells the prophets in those locations that when Paul gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be bound and turned over to the Gentiles. Paul has heard this before. And remember, Paul's a prophet also. He had more of the gift of prophecy than anybody else listed in the entire New Testament. Paul knows that what they're doing is telling the truth. And Paul keeps moving forward. And they get to the next place, and the prophets there tell them, uh, you know, Paul, when you get to Jerusalem, they're going to arrest you. Yes, I know that. I've heard it before. But don't you realize, Paul, that if that happens, you will suffer? Uh, yes, I know that. Well, th doesn't that bother you? Yeah, but I'm going there anyway. Does there somehow seem to be a disconnect between Paul's response and what clearly the Spirit of God was revealing every time Paul ran into another group of believers. No, because prophecy and predestination are not the same thing. And we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. So as we look at this prophecy, and he gets it here from a prophet by the name of Agabus, that guy got his name in scripture because he made one prophecy. Verse 10, when we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now for a Jew, that was the worst thing that you could imagine happening. It was bad enough to get turned over to the Jewish authorities. They were nasty characters. But to be touched by a Gentile? Oh, that sounds terrible. Paul, doesn't this scare you? Don't you get cold sweats and chills and wake up at night with bad dreams when you know this is going to happen? No. What we learn by seeing these incidents happening in the life of Paul, the very first thing that we learn is that prophets could foretell the future. But that did not mean that they could interpret or apply the future in the life of another person as pertaining to the will of God. Let me say that again. Prophets could foretell the future. They got it right. They got it accurately. But that did not mean that they could interpret or apply the future 
in the life of another person as pertaining to the will of God. They could merely tell them what was going to happen. They were shown the raw data, but they were not shown the application. And what God was doing through that proclamation. The second thing that we learn as we look at that text is Paul also had the gift of prophecy, but he knew with compelling force that God had called him to go to Jerusalem. Didn't matter what was going to happen there. You see, it was a test that Paul was facing each place he went. It's almost like God was saying, Paul, are you committed? Paul, are you committed? Kiss the next town. Paul, are you committed? Perhaps even the devil was joyfully gloating over this. Satan has his emissaries everywhere. He's got them here. There's some here tonight. You can't see them. But they're demonic forces all over the world, and they gather information. No doubt by this point in Paul's journey, the Satan's henchmen, or his hench demons, had heard the message that Paul was going to get arrested in Jerusalem. They knew it was from the Spirit of God. They knew it was going to happen. I wonder how many times Paul got a little prod, like, Paul, look, you really don't want to go. Paul, you really don't want to go. Paul, you really don't want to go. But Paul was in the center of the will of God. He's not rejecting the will of God. He is merely seeing that God is confirming all along the way what is going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. He knows it in advance. He's a prophet also. But he does not flex in the determination to fulfill the will of God. Most of us would have flexed. Most of us would have twisted. Most of us would have bent. Some of us would have broken. We would have resigned our commission. You and I face tests like this every day. We make decisions based on our comfort and convenience rather than making decisions based on the Word of God. We know what the Word says. We know that the Word is 100% accurate, just like these prophets were 100% accurate as to what was going to happen to Paul when he got to Jerusalem. We no longer have the gift of prophecy being given today. We have the complete final revelation of God, the scriptures. So when you read the scriptures and you know the will of God concerning something, it's just like Agabus or any of the other prophets who were telling Paul, this is what's going to happen. Scripture tells us what's going to happen also. There's all kinds of prophetic things in scripture. One third of scripture is prophecy. The question is, how are we going to apply it? You know, there are several major applications if you know that Christ could come back at any moment, and indeed he can. How it changes your life, if you really believe it. John tells us, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. If you have the expectancy of the blessed hope, that's what John calls it, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, that's Jesus Christ coming back for his church, that's our blessed hope. It could happen at any moment. If you really believe that, it determines what you do every moment of the day and night. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Prophetic truth is one of the strongest motivating factors, if you really believe it, for living a holy life. And because Jesus Christ could come back at any moment, prophetic truth is also one of the greatest motivating factors for witnessing to those who are lost. Because we know from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 13, 
that there's coming a day when after the rapture of the church takes place, that everybody who is left alive on the face of the earth at that time will be deceived. If they've heard the gospel, if they've rejected the gospel, God himself will send them strong delusion who believed the lie but, did, but received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. If you believe prophetic truth, it is a motivation for witnessing. What you do in your life is proof of what you believe and what you don't believe. If you're not living a holy life, it's proof you do not believe prophetic scripture. If you're not busy every day sharing Christ with someone else, it's proof that you do not believe prophetic scripture. The Apostle Paul was a prophet. The Apostle Paul knew what was coming. He knew what it would cost him. And he went ahead with it anyway. Now, folks, we know prophetic scripture is true. We've seen various prophetic scriptures as we've gone through these various things related to Tyre, for example. It takes place literally, precisely, exactly as God prophesied it would happen. It does not take place allegorically. It does not pl take place metaphorically. It does not take place sort of in a general way, but leave out the details. It is precise to the letter. All prophecy that has been fulfilled in the past, you look at the 300 and some prophecies that relate to Jesus Christ and his first coming, they're all literal. The same is true about those prophecies that relate to his return. But you see, we're not like Paul. Paul knew what was coming. And he set his face, as did Jesus, to go to Jerusalem. Jesus knew what would happen at Jerusalem. Paul knew what would happen at Jerusalem. We look at that and we say, but, but if I live a holy life, people won't like me. It's going to cost me something. Or we say, if I testify for Christ, I might lose my job. Ever had that problem? I have a relative, I'll not tell you who, but I have a relative who was working for a firm and the boss at the firm told this relative to lie for him on the phone and say that he was not in. That relative said, but I can't do that because I'm a Christian. That relative lost their job. Trying to live a holy life. There are many Christians in the United States today who have been told, you cannot have a Bible on your desk. Teachers, for example, in public schools. Others who work for companies where that religious stuff is really not part of our company, so we don't want you to have Bible verses pinned to your personal note board over your desk. We certainly don't want you talking to clients about religious matters. If you believe prophetic scripture, it is one of the strongest motivators for living a holy life and for witnessing for Christ. You know what will happen if you do those things. Are you, like Jesus and like Paul, willing to go up to Jerusalem even though you know it will happen? Or do you take the easy way out? You just sort of compromise your Christian faith and figure, well, I've got my fire insurance policy. I know I'm headed for heaven and not for hell. Uh, 
And after all, God will save the elect. He doesn't need me to do it. You know what will happen. You're getting the same kind of a test that Paul had here. Every place he went, they told him, if you go to Jerusalem, you will be arrested by the Jewish authorities and you will be turned over to the Gentiles. Are you passing your test? Or in the eyes of God, are you failing your test? Well, enough meddling. That was the second point. Paul also had the gift of prophecy, but knew with compelling force that God had called him to go to Jerusalem. So why were the prophets giving these prophecies? Well, I think there's some rather obvious implications. Number one, that would imply that the other prophets were not prophesying for the benefit of Paul, though they thought they were. But they were really prophesying so that the rest of the church would know in advance that, number one, that they were true prophets. You remember the test for a true prophet in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 18 was a true prophet always had 100% accuracy. 100%. If he made one mistake, he was to be stoned. You didn't want to be a prophet if you weren't really a prophet from God. Nobody had to be afraid of a prophet who made false prophecies. God was using those prophets not only to give Paul a test as he went along the road to see whether or not he was committed to the center of the will of God, but in each of those locations there were people who heard the prophecies and they were scared. They said, Paul, don't do it. But it was a proof to those people that this particular person in our text tonight, it happens to be Agabus, that this particular person was a true prophet from God. And number two, and I'm sure that this was the case, those prophets proclaimed it publicly, not just with Paul, but with the rest of the church present, so that the rest of the church would be able to pray for Paul as he went through the sufferings that God had ordained for him. And as Paul asks prayer at the end of the book of Ephesians, at the end of that powerful passage dealing with the spiritual warfare, and Paul is involved in spiritual warfare here, praying for us also that boldness may be given unto me to open my mouth to speak as I ought to speak. Yes, Paul was faced many times with the temptation, I am so tired of getting beat up. I am so tired of hurting every place I go. I think maybe I won't preach as vociferously here as I did in some of those other places. Paul asked the church for prayer. Pray for me that I would open my mouth boldly to speak. As these prophets prophesied, I think that every church along the way, as the Apostle Paul was there, began to pray for Paul as he went up to Jerusalem because they knew this was going to happen to Paul. It might not have been happened to them, but it was going to happen to Paul. Do you have the heart and compassion to pray for other believers whom you know are about to go through or are going through times of suffering because of their testimony for Christ or do you sort of just forget them and shove them to the back burner because you don't want to think about suffering as it relates to Christianity you pray for your brothers and sisters in Africa who are being tortured and some of them killed by ISIS the other terrorist organizations, those in Nigeria. You pray for Peter and Lucy Lacayo, who support through Judith Collins by this church, who have suffered many things for Christ. Or do you sort of forget them 
This was so the rest of the church would be able to pray for Paul as he went through the sufferings that God had ordained for him. The third thing that we learn about prophecy and predestination from this passage is that people who heard the prophecy were not always motivated by the Spirit of God in the advice that they gave. They gave the prophecies correctly, but in particular those who heard the prophecies didn't always give Spirit-led advice. Paul, don't go. Their advice was based on the safest thing to do, on rationalism rather than on revelation. The advice that they gave was the avoidance of suffering. The prophets spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit, but the people who heard the prophecies did not always give the right advice. The fourth thing that we learn as we look at this text is that prophecy merely tells us what will happen. Prophecy does not predestine what will happen. You've got to keep these things in the right order. Predestination has already occurred. In the divine counsels of the eternal past, prophecy is based on predestination. Predestination is not based on prophecy. It's not God looking down the corridors of time and seeing what will happen and then giving his prophecies on the basis of that because that makes God subject to history. But God is not subject to history. History is subject to God. The second major issue that we see as we get into the prophecies here we're running out of time, is what about female prophecy? The second major issue in the passage, if you've noticed it, is the four virgin daughters of Philip that prophesied. So what was going on? We should notice several things as we look at that. Be sure to read the text carefully every time you read it. By the way, and you know, this is where Paul has just showed up. He's just showed up at Caesarea. This is not Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is at the headwaters of the Jordan River. But Caesarea is on the coast. He's still on the coast from where he had been back in Acts chapter 8. And he is moved there because in Acts 8 is where he ran into the Ethiopian eunuch. But back in Acts 6, he'd been appointed as a deacon in the church of Jerusalem. So we find Philip showing up on three major occurrences in the book of Acts. Acts 6, Acts 8, Acts 21. He's living in Caesarea, which is on that northern sea coast of Israel. It says that Paul and his company went into Philip's house. He owned a house. He was there permanently in Caesarea. Something else to notice about his daughters there, it was not the daughters of Philip that prophesied Paul's persecution at Jerusalem. It was Agabus. Agabus had come down from Judea. He wasn't even a local prophet, so they were deferring to some local prophet. Not one of the girls got new special revelation regarding Paul. Something else that's rather interesting Philip had a normal family life. Last time we saw him was back in Acts 8. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now he'd been up in Samaria. He'd been up in the northern part of Israel. The Holy Spirit told him, Go south. He'd been involved in a great revival. Many people coming to Christ. And God says, I want you to go out in the desert. That doesn't make sense, Lord. We've got a great revival going on here. The apostles have come and they've seen that it's a great revival and they've said it's okay to have Samaritans be part of the body of Christ. And you remember that there was a big hubbub about a guy up there who wanted to, to have the same power as the apostles and he offered money named Simon the sorcerer. We get our term simony from that, trying to buy ecclesiastical office and trying to buy the ability to have spiritual authority. There's a lot going on in Samaria, and God tells him to go to the desert. And you know what? He went. 
When God directs, when God makes his will clear, the right response is obedience. And that's what Paul is doing here. That's what Philip had done. And because Philip did that and went down to Gaza and had the privilege of leading the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ, who was reading out of Isaiah 53 as Philip went to the chariot, and you remember that whole discussion there, how that treasurer of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, would not have been traveling alone. There would have been a bodyguard around him, and yet Philip was able to go right up to him, hear him reading, and he invited Philip to get in the chariot with him. God opens the right doors at the right time when you're in the center of his will. The will of God is the most important and always the safest place to be. And then it says that after he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, the spirit picked him up and took him up to Ozotis up along the coast. Gaza is also on the coast. And the Ethiopian eunuch saw him no more, went on his way rejoicing, and Philip headed north toward Caesarea. And it says he preached the gospel. It is he evangelized, that's the term that's used, and he's called Philip the evangelist, here in our passage. He evangelized all the way from Azotus all the way to Caesarea. From Gaza to Caesarea is about 75 miles. From Azotus to Caesarea is less than that, about 60 miles. It took him 19 years from the time we see him last in Acts chapter 8 until the time we see him tonight in Acts chapter 21. 19 years to go about 60 miles. And it says he was the evangelist and that he evangelized. It's a lot different than our modern day concept of evangelist. Guys who jet around in multi-million dollar jets from place to place and hold crusades and then leave everything behind and go off to someplace else. Or guys who come into a church to give pep talks for a week. Those guys today are called evangelists. The New Testament evangelist was a church planter. He was a man whom God gifted with the ability to lead other people to Christ and form them into a Bible preaching church, establish the church, and see leaders raised up in the church and then he'd move to the next location where he did church planting. That's Philip, 19 years to go 60 miles, evangelizing all the way as he went. There are churches all up the coast of Israel that were started there by Philip as we're going through the book of Acts. It says in verses 39 and 40, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, but the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So we see him ending in Caesarea in Acts 8.40. We pick him up in Caesarea in Acts chapter uh, 21. So in other words, it took Philip those 19 years to go that distance. And someplace during that time, we don't know where. We're not told. But someplace during that time, he got married. He not only got married, but he had a normal family life because it produced four children. He had a stable home life. He was living with his family. Also implies some other things. It implies that all four of his daughters were less than 19 years old. He's called Philip the Evangelist here. Verse 18, the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, that is one of the seven deacons that were chosen back in Acts chapter 6 and abode with him. Rather interesting. As I was looking at this passage tonight, and it has these four girls who are all under age 19, it struck me of a certain family that you know of in our church with four daughters under age 19, and I thought, maybe this is a prophecy of that particular man becoming an evangelist. <laughs> well, we'll see. Timothy, the young church planter, is the only other person, the only other person in the New Testament designated by the term evangelist. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul had trained Timothy to do what? Church planting. Timothy traveled as one of Paul's companions as Paul went on his missionary journeys, planting churches. He wasn't running around holding crusades. He wasn't running around giving pep talks in churches. 
He had learned from Paul what it meant to lead people to Christ and build them into a Bible-preaching church. Until God raised up leadership that could be appointed, and we've talked about that in the past, it didn't happen the way that it happens today in churches. They were appointed by the evangelist or by the apostle. Another thing to notice about this, it does not say that Philip's daughters were prophetesses. Did you pick that up? It says that they prophesied, but it does not call them prophetesses. Did you know that after the Gospels, that is by the time we get to the book of Acts and all the doctrinal epistles that follow, after the Gospels, there is only one other woman in the New Testament who is called a prophetess, and that's Jezebel. Revelation 2.20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. She wasn't really a prophetess. She merely called herself a prophetess. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, women are named who were prophetesses. But the only post-Gospel woman who called herself a prophetess was Jezebel in Revelation 2. There are also other false prophetesses in the Old Testament. For example, Nehemiah 6.14. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. Yes, there were some other false prophetesses. In the Old Testament, there were prophetesses who were real prophetesses, but what were they doing? They are singing the scriptures. Did you know that Miriam is called a prophetess? Exodus 15, 20, and Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. There were also women who were involved in the temple worship and apparently in the music of the temple who were called prophetesses. 2 Kings 22.14 and 2 Chronicles 34.22 refer to the same one. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Achbor and Shaphan and Asahiah went into Hilda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college and they communed with her. And that says exactly the same thing over in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 verse 22. We find one in the Gospels, Luke 2.36. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She also spent all of her time in the temple. Interesting. There are also those who were called the wife, uh, who, who were the wife of a prophet, who were called prophetesses because they were wives of a prophet. For example, Isaiah's wife, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. I went in unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord unto me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaaz. But even in the Old Testament, it was rare for a woman to have that kind of a title. Since the New Testament gift of prophet, which we studied in detail for a number of weeks about two years ago, since that gift of prophet was only given to men as a leadership gift, it is reasonable to assume that these four daughters of Philip were musically gifted and sang the prophetic scriptures. Now, that ties in with our time going gone tonight. <laughs> I wanted to talk about prophecy and predestination, but that's going to have to wait until next week. Our time is up. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for your word and for its power. We praise you because you are the true and living God. You are the God who has given us your word. It is final. It is authoritative. Father, we pray for your blessings upon it as it has gone forth tonight. That indeed it will touch our hearts and our lives. That if we really believe the prophetic scriptures, that is one of the strongest motivators to live lives of purity and holiness. That if we really believe the Holy Scriptures,
and particularly concerning the return of Christ. It is one of the most powerful motivators for witnessing for Jesus Christ to those who are lost. Regardless of what we know will be the consequences. There will be suffering if we do that. There will be repudiation by friends and family. There may be the loss of a job. It's a test that each one of us has to face. Will we backpedal? Will we compromise? Will we think only in terms of temporal and material things? Or will we be like Jesus who set his face as flint to go to Jerusalem while the disciples dragged along behind and Thomas mumbled about, well, let's go to Jerusalem and die with him? Will we be like Paul who, though he knew the truth of what would happen at Jerusalem, knew that God had called him to go? and declared quite boldly, as we saw in our text tonight, that he was not only willing to be bound at Jerusalem, but willing to die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. What we truly believe is always manifested in what we do. That's the proof of faith. Bless your word, Father. Cause each to apply it to his or her heart. And may Jesus Christ be glorified. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this evening.